you can ask our speaker after her presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming uh, dear Professor uh, Sorton uh, Silhorn. First, let me introduce her in a few seconds. Sorton is a professor of accounting at Ludwig Maximilian uh, Munich uh, in Germany uh, and the president of European Accounting Association. Sorton uh, research interest and focused on international financial reporting standard, IFRS. Financial reporting properties, empirical uh, accounting research, fair value accounting, disclosure, fundamental analysis, <coughs> audit uh, quality, is uh, a role of accounting information uh, in capital markets, uh, the di uh, digital transformation uh, in accounting. His research appeared in leading journal like uh, management uh, science. The Journal of Accounting Review, European Accounting Review, Review of Accounting Studies. He serves as Associate Editor at European Accounting Review and on the Editorial Board of Accounting and, uh, and, uh, and Business Research. Advanced in Accounting, Business Research, Controlling uh, Management Review, International Journal of Material and Accounting, Journal of International Accounting Research. Now we will start our seminar with uh, Professor Thurston uh, Silhor. All right, uh, Mohammed, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, very long introduction, it seems. A lot of research interests and all that. Um, thanks for inviting me to this talk. Um, I'm always happy to talk about my research and share um, some of what I've been doing with those that are interested. Um, I see a number of people here in the audience. Um, I don't know much about your backgrounds, so I hope that my talk will um, meet with your interest and that you're going to take away something useful. Please uh, do feel free to ask questions uh, whenever anything is unclear. And um, I guess we'll have about an hour of presentation and then uh, afterwards uh, there might be more time for, for Q&A. Um, Mohammed already introduced me, so I don't need this slide, obviously. So I'm going to skip over that and go right to today's topic. Um, I actually would like to present some of the findings from a recent paper that I'm actually currently working on and that will be resubmitted to the European Accounting Review um, for consideration for publication actually tomorrow. So this is a paper that is undergoing revision um, and uh, that for that reason, I cannot currently share and it's not currently public. Uh, this is co-authored work together with one of my dear colleagues, Amira Melsadeh, uh, at the University of Oxford in the UK, and another colleague, Martin Glaum. He's at uh, WHU uh, here in Germany. So what are we doing in this paper? This is a review paper that summarizes a body of studies in a specific area and we're all interested very much in empirical research in accounting and this research that we're reviewing here is about goodwill so goodwill arising from m a transactions business combinations and the accounting for goodwill and this is a long line of research that goes back way into the 90s and has taken up speed and significance uh, in the early 2000s when the accounting rules for goodwill changed under IFRS and also under US GAAP. And there's a lot of research, uh, about 75 papers that we summarize on the question, what are the determinants of goodwill reporting decisions? And is goodwill reporting decision useful for investors and other stakeholders? Um, so we try to summarize that research and we also try to assess that research in terms of its validity. So we want to say something about these studies in terms of are they actually credible? Can we actually believe the findings? And can we actually learn something about accounting regulation from those findings? Why do we go to all this work in summarizing these many, many, many studies? We do so for two reasons. The first reason is we would like to learn from these studies something that is of general interest to accounting theory. So all of these studies, although they are all specifically about goodwill accounting, 
they're actually all addressing questions that are also relevant more generally for financial reporting as a whole. So it's always about, first of all, what determines financial reporting decisions by managers? What is it that managers um, think about and what is it that um, drives them to make accounting decisions in certain ways? Um, the other question is, um, given that managers make, make certain accounting decisions, how decision useful is the resulting information for stakeholders, for example, for the capital market? For example, um, is a goodwill impairment um, something that provides new information to the markets? Or is it something that is uh, really mainly driven by um, managers' own interests and earnings management incentives and basically um, devoid of any of any interesting information. So we're, we're doing this literature review to say something more, more general, more broadly about accounting theory overall. But secondly, also, and this is my second bullet point here under why. Secondly, we also want to contribute to the current standard setting debate. Currently, the ISB, which makes IFRS, um, is debating whether it should actually change accounting requirements for goodwill. This has been an ongoing discussion for at least the last 15 years. I actually came upon this uh, when I was myself a doctoral student in the early 2000s, and I actually did my doctoral dissertation on this topic, on goodwill accounting, when it was just about to be reformed in the early 2000s. And since then, the discussion has been, you know, is this current goodwill reporting that we have under IFRS, the, the so-called impairment only approach, is this actually a good accounting requirement? Does it work? Does it provide decision useful information? Or is it so um, full of discretion that managers can basically do what they want and manage earnings in order to manipulate uh, the stock price or in order to mislead investors. So how do we go about this? Um, we have selected or we have searched um, all the relevant journals, about 30 journals in total, for all the studies that conduct empirical tests and empirical research of accounting related to goodwill and M&A transactions. So we have found 74 empirical goodwill studies from the leading, let's say, 30 academic accounting journals. And we went through all of these studies and we tried to classify them in different categories um, according to what research question they were addressing. And we summarized all of these papers in a series of tables. And we also qualitatively discuss some of the main findings and also some of the method issues, some of the validity concerns. Just to give you an overview, and I'm not expected, I'm not, ex I don't expect you to read this, but just to give you an overview what our main uh, figure in the paper looks like. So this is basically a summary of all of the papers or an overview of all of the papers that we analyzed. And we're summarizing them, we're, we're categorizing them in five different groups according to the research questions that they address. The first group is about recognition. So this has to do with the recognition requirements for, for goodwill. And the essential question here is, is goodwill actually an asset or should we rather um, account for this excess of purchase price over the fair value of net assets acquired? Should we actually account for this uh, as an expense because it seems to be worthless? Um, that, that is one of the fundamental questions and has been for many, many years, at least since the 70s, how to account for goodwill um, when it first arises in a business combination. Secondly, the second uh, question has to do with initial measurement. What is the amount, if we're going to recognize goodwill, what is the amount that we should assign to it? And this amount at which goodwill is initially measured, that comes from the so-called purchase price allocation. And people argue that the purchase price allocation that will determine the goodwill amount is highly discretionary. There are a lot of um, 
flexibility that managers can exploit. And the question in this literature, literature is, um, what determines management's reporting decisions in the context of the purchase price allocation? Is there any evidence that managers actually um, engage in earnings management in this context? Third, um, there's a question related to subsequent measurement. So once we have recognized goodwill at a certain amount, for example, when Volkswagen, the German car maker, when they acquired Porsche in, the, uh, in 2012, they went through the purchase price allocation and they broke down the 27 billion purchase price that they had paid for Porsche. They broke it down into the different components and ultimately found a goodwill of about 19 billion. And the question then is, this 19 billion that is recognized on Volkswagen's books, what happens to that in subsequent years? And under IFRS and US GAAP, um, what companies have to do with this is they have to um, assess goodwill for impairment on a regular basis. And the question is, does that impairment testing actually provide and produce decision useful information? So this is this whole line of research here in this middle column. Then in the fourth column, we look at uh, studies that um, are interested in disclosures. So there's a lot of disclosures around M&A transactions. For example, the reasons why the deal was made, um, the whole breakdown of the purchase price into its component parts, um, the parameters of the goodwill impairment test, so the discount rate, the future cash flows, the growth rate assumption, all of these disclosures. And the question is, are these disclosures actually transparent and are they useful for investors to understand the economics underlying the business combinations? This is another line of lit literature that looks at that. And then finally, there's a line of research that is interested in all of these four questions, but it specifically looks at what are some of the factors, for example, governance, or auditing or enforcement, some of the factors that determine or that influence to what extent, for example, um, managers engage in earnings management or disclosures are informative and things like that. So this is about moderating factors that kind of vary and moderate these four relationships um, up here. So this is a broad introduction to what we're doing here. So you need to take away, this is a study that would be of interest to you if you're into financial accounting, especially interested in goodwill, accounting under IFRS, US GAAP, um, so accounting for M&A transactions, basically. Do you guys have any questions so far? Something in the chat I see. Okay. Okay, so Sharif asks, uh, can I send the paper? Unfortunately, I cannot send it yet because it's currently being revised and we're almost done with it, but we would actually like to um, resubmit it first. And then once it hopefully becomes accepted, then I'd be happy to share it. But I would invite you to please uh, stay in touch with me. Um, I can actually send everybody my email address um, and uh, I'd be happy to um, keep in touch with you if you're interested in the paper. Just send it to me later. Uh, just send me an email later on. Good. So my agenda for this talk, and I'm already in the middle of it, is first of all to give you some of the findings uh, of this goodwill review that we did. So what does it actually say? Secondly, I want to talk about something of more general interest not only interesting maybe for those that uh, care about goodwill accounting, but more interesting uh, for anybody who um, is involved in accounting research, especially uh, especially um, uh, empirical accounting research. Um, let me see another question in here. So Mohammed is asking, does the discussion include companies that have minority interests? Um, my discussion today will not um, cover that specific point, but uh, 
all of the studies that we look at are looking into uh, M&A transactions, business combinations, where companies, uh, whether where the acquirer either acquires 100% of the target or less than 100%, in which case we have minority interest. But in most studies, minority interests are not a specific issue that they focus on. Okay. So I want to I want to talk a little bit about more generally what makes an empirical study high quality and what makes empirical results credible. Um, and by doing that, by talking about that, I'm also identifying certain challenges and problems, and I want to use those challenges and problems to suggest certain promising new directions for empirical accounting research more broadly, not only for goodwill, but generally. Because um, Mohammed, when he invited me, he asked me, you know, can you talk about something uh, that has to do with new approaches and new developments? And I said, well, I can try. And I'm going to give you some of my views, at least, about what I think uh, we should do more of in accounting research more broadly. And then finally, Mohammed also mentioned that I'm currently the president of the European Accounting Association. I want to briefly introduce to those of you who don't know it yet, our European Accounting Association. So we're a, an association of about uh, 2,500 accounting academics, but not only from Europe, actually all over the world. Um, we have members from about 100 countries, including, for example, 250 from the United States. We currently, and I checked this before I came to this talk today, I checked this, uh, we actually currently, and that's a pity, have nobody at all from Egypt, um, which needs to change, right? Um, but we do have, let's see. So where are you guys from? We have nobody from Algeria yet. We have Egypt. Oh, I, I was wrong. I, I was going to say we have nobody from, uh, from Algeria, but we have a few people from Egypt. So seven last year, five wow. this year. What about Nigeria, Prof? Say again. From, what about Nigeria? I'm from Nigeria. Nigeria. We have. Uh, well, you need to you need to join us. So you'll be the first. Yeah. Thank you. I will immediately. Right. So Yemen. We don't have anybody from Yemen. Palestine. Um, we used to have somebody from Palestine, but not recently. So this is a pity. You guys. Um, you guys should should consider joining us. And I'm going to talk more about the European Accounting Association later on, but from this list, I think you get the impression that we're pretty international and we welcome anybody from any country uh, around the world, including from the Middle East uh, for sure. Good, so let me keep talking here. In terms of the institutional background, in, in case you're not familiar with goodwill accounting, let me just briefly summarize it. Um, so I'm talking about international financial reporting standards mostly. But a lot of studies actually come from the United States. So in the United States, under US GAAP, um, they have very similar accounting methods for goodwill and business combinations. And goodwill, as you might remember from your courses, uh, is the excess of the purchase price over the fair value of net assets acquired. Um, maybe I can show you um, an example. And I would like... I would like to ask you if you can see this once I show it to you. So I want to show you the goodwill calculation from the Volkswagen Porsche acquisition, which is one of the biggest ones uh, in the automotive industry that was ever made and was a big deal in Germany when it happened. Um, and we have here some interesting information about it. And I'll show you in a second when I find it. So here, um, can you see? Can you see this annual report here now? Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All yes. Right. So, so what what Volkswagen Please. did? It it actually went out to buy Porsche. And here on this side, you see what they actually paid for it. Um, 
So Volkswagen ended up paying something like 27, and this is a billion euros, 27 billion euros for Porsche. And then in this table, it explains, okay, what is it that we were getting in return? So it said, okay, we acquired brand names, technology, customer relationships, property plant and equipment, cash and so forth. And the fair values of all of these assets and liabilities ended up being 37 billion in the assets and 29 billion in the liabilities. So roughly, what is this? Roughly 8 billion as a fair value of net assets. But remember, they paid 27 billion for it. So what this resulted in, what this uh, brought about is a goodwill of roughly 19 billion, right? So this business combination says here, generated goodwill of 18,871 million euros, right? This is a, this is a big amount. And this is really um, what goodwill is, the excess of the purchase price, 20, 27 billion over the fair value of net assets acquired, uh, 18, uh, 8 billion, so 19 billion. And under IFRS, we have to recognize this as an asset. Now, until the early 2000s, this asset, this goodwill was amortized over some useful life assumption, um, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, and this, this requirement, amortization, was uh, was um, uh, eliminated in the early 2000s under IFRS and under US GAAP at the same time. So both actually um, eliminated goodwill accounting and replaced it with an impairment only approach. And um, in the chat right now, Zakia, I think if I pronounce this correctly, is asking why is amortization no longer used and why are they reconsidering it? Well, there's a lot of, uh, arguments against amortization that well made the ISB reject it and, and eliminate it. And one of the arguments was this goodwill is actually a very uncertain asset. If you think about this, goodwill is basically nothing but the difference between what was paid and the fair value of all of these assets. So what this 19 billion actually is, is not clear. And because we don't know exactly what it is, it's very hard to determine the useful life. And if you don't know how long the, the goodwill is going to last, how can you usefully, how can you sensibly calculate amortization charges? The amortization charges, it was argued, was actually very arbitrary and useless for investors. So amortization was an arbitrary number that nobody, uh, nobody had any use for. That was the assumption. Um, so they rejected it. And from then on, um, goodwill was only tested for impairment once a year or whenever something happened, like the corona crisis, for example. Over the years, however, it turns out that companies almost stopped writing off goodwill. So many companies accumulated goodwill on their balance sheets because they no longer amortized it. And nobody or very few companies actually ever made any impairment losses on goodwill. So Volkswagen, for example, it still has that same 19 billion goodwill from the Porsche acquisition that it acquired in 2012. That's still on Volkswagen's books at the same amount, right? No amortization, no impairment. And over the years, the ISB and the FASB, they were thinking, OK, um, is this goodwill impairment test actually working? It seems to be. Um, very discretionary and it seems to fail to make companies write off the goodwill when it's economically, uh, when that is economically warranted, right? And of course, companies, they like the goodwill impairment test because they can avoid expenses uh, from goodwill write-offs that they would have incurred if they had to have, uh, if they, were still, um, uh, if they still had to um, amortize goodwill over the useful life. So Ahmad is, is actually right. Ahmad says, um, okay, um, companies don't like the amortization approach because amortization reduces future profits. That's exactly one of the reasons why the impairment only approach 
is actually valued by preparers, uh, but it seems to be problematic. Okay, so the concern is that the impairment only approach is not working because managers are playing around with it and they're manipulating the numbers. Okay. Good, I'm looking, I'm, I'm taking questions uh, from the chat here. As long as I see them, if I don't see them, if I ignore you, please just speak up. So does the goodwill appear in the standalone financial statements of Volkswagen alone or in the consolidated? So this one from the Volkswagen, uh, from the Porsche acquisition, this one only appears in the consolidated financial statements. Um, in the standalone financial statements of the Volkswagen, uh, of the Volkswagen parent company, uh, we would basically only see uh, this amount as an investment in um, as an investment in subsidiaries on the standalone balance sheet. In the consolidated balance sheet, we will see the brand name and the goodwill and all the other assets and liabilities of the acquired Porsche company. All right. So let's go into this empirical literature. I mean, when I talk to my students about this in my IFRS accounting classes, most students, they don't know and uh, would not have expected that we in accounting, that we professors, that we actually do empirical research and um, that we do research that can actually be relevant to these standard setting debates. And this is really what the goodwill accounting literature, what the empirical goodwill studies are trying to do. So these studies are trying to address two broad issues. First of all, is goodwill related accounting useful for investors and other stakeholders? Right, so what's the value relevance, for example? What's the information content? What is the predictive ability of goodwill and related accounting amounts? And why do we care about this? Well, if we could show that goodwill and impairments, for example, or amortization, that they actually seem to capture what investors are interested in and that they're correlated with market prices, for example, that might signal that the impairment, uh, that the goodwill accounting standards actually work, right? Because under IFRS, accounting is intended to be value relevant or decision useful. And if empirical research could document that these accounting amounts are decision useful, then this is good news for the standard setters. On the other hand, everybody knows that a lot of these goodwill related accounting decisions or disclosure decisions have a lot of uh, flexibility. For example, if you're going to do an impairment or not, that has to do with your assumptions about future cash flows, discount rates, growth rates, and all that. So companies, it seems, if they want to, they can avoid doing an impairment. Uh, and they also can be very flexible, for example, in terms of um, what kinds of disclosures they offer. And if companies have discretion, the question becomes, um, do these accounting standards work in terms of forcing companies, for example, to impair, to write off goodwill when the economics suggest it or when the economics require it? Or is the flexibility so large that managers could avoid a write-off even if economically there should be one? So these are the two broad areas that the literature covers. And I said, uh, as I said, there are 75, roughly 75 studies only from the last 20 years that look at these types of issues and that conduct empirical analyses to answer these kinds of questions. And maybe to go back a little bit more in more detail into these five categories. So these five research questions, recognition, initial measurement, subsequent measurement, disclosure and moderators. Um, I have now five slides that basically summarize each of these insights from these different literatures. So this is about the first question, recognition. And basically what this literature seems to show, and I'm really simplifying here uh, and summarizing very strongly, it seems like overall studies show that goodwill accounting produces decision useful amounts. The market, investors, analysts, they seem to 
recognize they seem to perceive goodwill as an asset. So in the context of the Porsche acquisition, it seems like markets uh, would would say, okay, Volkswagen paid 27 billion for net assets worth 8 billion. So they paid a goodwill of 19 billion. That goodwill is actually an asset, it's not worthless. Right? So that's what the studies seem to suggest. There is value in the goodwill and studies document this by showing that goodwill actually correlates with market prices. Goodwill impairment also correlates with market returns. And this is true both before the impairment only approach was introduced and also afterwards. We don't really know exactly if goodwill accounting became more informative after the impairment only approach was introduced. That's something that's difficult to figure out. But we know that on average, in general, it is somewhat informative. Now, the second question is, do companies, you, uh, do managers use discretion and do they behave opportunistically when it comes to um, applying the purchase price allocation? So the purchase price allocation is actually what I showed you here. This is a purchase price allocation, right? So this table allocates the purchase price of 27 billion to all of the assets and liabilities acquired. So what this does is it values all of the individual assets and liabilities acquired at fair value, and then the residual, the difference between all of those values and the purchase price, that's going to be the goodwill. So the big question is, how do companies approach this purchase price allocation? Do they um, do this in an opportunistic, strategic way. And one of the assumptions is if companies um, have an incentive to avoid future expenses, they have a large incentive to allocate as much as possible to goodwill. And there's some evidence from the studies that companies actually do this, that um, some of the decisions about goodwill measurement in the purchase price allocation, that these decisions are consistent with earnings management incentives, managers trying to avoid future amortization costs, which the other assets would generate. And they try to lump everything into goodwill because they know that's something that they don't have to amortize in the future. Third question is, how about subsequent measurement? You know that the subsequent measurement no longer consists of amortization, but it consists of impairment testing. And the standard setter would say, the impairment test works if it reflects the economic decline in the goodwill that the company has. So when the company um, acquires another company and has a large goodwill, and that acquisition disappoints expectations, for example, uh, the synergies that were expected fail to be materialized, then the impairment test should actually signal that and goodwill should be written off. Um, and the question is, is that actually happening? So it seems like from the studies, it seems like goodwill impairment decisions appear to reflect economic deterioration of goodwill. So there is some association with market returns, for example, and future accounting performance. So if a company performs badly after an acquisition, it's more likely to write off goodwill. Also, when goodwill ends up written off, when there is an impairment, this is an event that predicts future operating performance. So if you have an impairment today, chances are or it's likely that you're going to have lower cash flows, lower returns in the future. So there is some indication that the goodwill impairment approach works in the sense that when you have an impairment, then um, this is reflective, that is reflecting uh, economic developments. But at the same time, we also have to say that um, there are a lot of examples where companies that look like they should be having an impairment, they actually don't have one, they avoid it. And that's more, more difficult uh, to research for reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. Now, the fourth question has to do with disclosures. 
do companies actually comply with the disclosure requirements in the accounting standards? Um, and if they don't, what's the reason? And here again, it seems like companies are using these disclosure decisions opportunistically. Those companies that believe that their acquisitions uh, are performing well, they give more information. And those that um, that probably have badly performing acquisitions, they, they give less information, they give less transparency about that. And finally then, we've looked at studies that try to understand if monitoring by, for example, uh, the auditor or enforcement uh, by um, oversight bodies, if that will render the accounting more information, uh, in, more decision useful, and if it renders disclosures more transparent. And there is some evidence that, you know, some of the weaknesses in goodwill reporting can be mitigated and can be um, reduced by stronger and stricter oversight. Uh, that's something that is not specific to goodwill. That's actually something we can see in almost any context in financial reporting. If you have better oversight, stronger enforcement, stronger institutions, then the accounting is going to be of higher quality. Good. Any questions so far on this literature? I mean, this is, uh, of course, a very, very condensed discussion of these 75 papers here in about uh, a 10 or 15 minute time span. So I can't do justice to all of them, of course. But uh, again, you're welcome to uh, approach me and and get more information on, on some of these studies if you're interested. Now, let me talk about, let me talk maybe 10, 15 minutes about generally what I think um, some of the issues in these studies are and how we can maybe um, improve accounting research in the future to have more valid and more interesting insights. And this picture probably contains one of the most important and one of the most um, useful concepts that I've ever seen in my career. If any of you are interested in accounting uh, or in, in research generally, for example, in the context of a master's thesis or of a PhD, or if you're a researcher yourself and you don't know this yet, um, I would highly recommend take a look at the so-called Libby boxes. So these boxes here that you see are a very nice way to summarize a research project and ask questions about its validity. Is it a research project that is promising? Is this a good study? And these Libby boxes have been invented by a colleague uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, Bob Libby. This is actually from the 80s originally. And uh, he has been publishing about this um, again and again. And this picture is from uh, an, an article in Accounting Organizations and Society from 2002, together with two co-authors. And it summarized what these Libby boxes are about. The Libby boxes are also called the predictive validity framework because they show us the conditions under which an empirical study uh, generates valid conclusions. So the idea is that in any study, you have a conceptual level, the theory level, so to speak, and you have an operational level, a level at which you are operationalizing the concepts for empirical measurement. So this is the theory level where you're relating a concept A to a concept B. And let's maybe translate that into, uh, into the goodwill accounting space. Let's, for example, think about a study that's interested in um, what drives impairment decisions. That's actually my dissertation paper that I wrote uh, in 2003. Um, and that uh, that gave me my PhD degree. I asked, OK, companies are making decisions about impairment. Some companies make an, some companies record a goodwill impairment. Some companies don't. And among those that record an impairment, some record high amounts, some record low amounts. So I was asking what explains 
whether or not companies impair goodwill and among those that do, what explains the amount? So the concept, the dependent variable for me was something like goodwill impairment. So goodwill impairment. This could be a dummy variable, yes or no, or it could be um, a, an amount, some amount. And my idea was, and this is directly related to what the standard setters were worrying about, my idea was that um, it could be that in addition to the economic underlying factors of the of the M a deal, goodwill impairment could also reflect management's opportunistic incentives. So one of the independent variables I was interested in is actually management's incentives. So this is uh, my main dependent, my main independent variable. So I wanted to show whether goodwill impairment is related to management incentives. Now I had to I had to look at uh, ways of operationalizing incentives and also um, operationalizing goodwill impairment. How do I measure this? Because in an empirical study, of course, you need to quantify things. And this then has to do with these two arrows here. So how do you quantify? How do you operationalize incentives? How do you operationalize goodwill impairment? Goodwill impairment was easy. That is something that you could collect from companies' financial statements. Did they have impairment, yes or no? And what was the amount? But incentives are a little bit more difficult to operationalize. How do you measure if a manager has an incentive to manage earnings? So you could look at, for example, do they do they have accounting-based bonus plans? Um, does the uh, company have debt covenants that are close to being breached? And some other proxies uh, that, that the research uses here. So one important factor in a research study is do these operational variables, do they capture in a meaningful way the theoretical concepts up here? This has to do with construct validity. Okay. The second question is, is the study able to identify a causal effect here? Right? Is there actually a causal effect of the independent variable on the uh, dependent variable? So are incentives causing impairments or no impairments, or are they just correlated? Is it just a statistical association? And if you're going to say something is causal, then you will have to rule out any other influential confounding variables. So you have to have internal validity. So let's look at an example from the Goodwill research. So here's a study that finds something like this. It basically finds good, the goodwill impairment only approach is less useful to investors than amortization. That was one of the big questions that standard setters were most interested in when they had, in the early 2000s, when they had eliminated amortization and introduced the goodwill impairment only approach. The question was, did this improve things, right? Is goodwill accounting better now? Is it more useful? Is it more decision relevant now? Now that we've moved away from amortization and moved towards impairment only. That's what these guys are trying to establish. Now, if you look at the study, and that's what they conclude as well, they show that the impairment only approach is actually yet less useful than the amortization approach. And if you take that as at face value, you would have to tell the ISP, well, you need to go back on this decision. You need to go back to the impairment only approach. But the question that we had is, is this study actually valid or does it have problems? For example, how do these researchers, how do they actually measure this notion of useful to investors? How do they measure this? Right? So if you have something like useful to investors here as a concept, how do you measure this? What is that? And what they do is they use the notion of value relevance. 
So this is an empirical approach where we look at to what extent do goodwill numbers correlate with market prices or market returns. And we say, OK, if they correlate strongly with market returns, then it seems like investors are using information for pricing the stock that is also used in figuring out goodwill and goodwill impairment. And that is a good news, that is good news. But it's not clear whether value relevance actually measures usefulness to investors very well. The standard setters are not clear on this and in academic, uh, in academic research, there are huge debates about this. And I've brought you two papers here that have this debate about what value relevance even means. Does it actually say anything about usefulness? So not sure what to conclude there. Also, is the study actually able to establish that moving away from the amortization to the goodwill impairment only, did that actually cause the decline in usefulness or was something else going on? So what this study does, it compares data from this time period. So value relevance before 2005 to value relevance after 2005. So this is a pre post comparison. And they say that after 2005 value relevance is lower. Than before. Does that mean that the reason for this is because of the impairment only approach? Not sure. It's not clear at all. So this paper, what I want to what I want to say with this is this paper and many other papers actually have problems in terms of construct validity, the way they measure their variables and what they conclude from them, and also problems in terms of internal validity where they are potentially forgetting about other explanations that they have a problem that they that they're not ruling out. So we're saying in, in our in our paper. If you're going to read a study, if you're going to conduct a study. Make sure that you are paying attention to construct validity. There are several problems with that in the goodwill literature. Make sure that you have internal validity so that you can actually establish a causal effect. Um, and rule out alternative explanations and also and that's something I haven't talked about yet. Worry about uh, and consider external validity to what extent do the results of a single study actually generalize to a broader population to a broader uh, to broader settings. Many studies that we have looked at at least 85% uh, of the studies only look at a single country and you can guess what country that is. Most studies actually look at US companies. Will the results hold in other countries? Not clear, right? And this is especially uh, problematic because um, context factors are going to vary quite a bit. So goodwill accounting in Egypt might be different from goodwill accounting in Germany, which is different from goodwill accounting in the UK. So we don't know if one study shows this in Germany, is that same thing also going to happen in France? So this is an external validity problem. The second external validity concern in the goodwill literature is about predictive validity, about prediction studies. There are a lot of studies that ask if a company has an impairment today, does that predict lower cash flows or lower stock returns in the future. And these studies, they run a regression of impairment uh, of, of cash flow tomorrow on impairment today and establishing uh, um, and establishing a statistical association. And they conclude from that that impairment today predicts cash flows tomorrow. But the question is, is that actually um, a valid conclusion? Because only because we show it in the data today doesn't say that this is going to hold in the future as well. So we have to be more careful. We have to worry about, we have to think about, um, is this going to replicate in a holdout sample? In uh, Is this going to apply out of sample as well? Good. So we've, we have basically in our paper, we have basically um, diagnosed 
quite a few um, validity problems and we've also extracted several um, research insights that can safely be uh, that can safely be uh, concluded from from this body of studies even even given the validity concerns but given that there are still a lot of open questions um, and the standard setters still don't know exactly whether amortization or impairment is better we believe there are three directions for where the research could move to in order to um, resolve some of these uh, some of these open issues and that's not only true for goodwill accounting but for any type of empirical accounting approach so the first direction that we advocate is think more broadly about theories and empirical methods most studies um, are based on economic theories principal agent theory um, positive accounting theory about earnings management incentives um, and it uses most studies use empirical archival methods that means data that has been collected for a purpose other than other than the current study so they're taking uh, data from databases all of we, all of you know these databases um, data stream world scope uh, crisp compustat and so on and so forth and um, these data have limitations what they don't tell you is for example why companies why managers behave the way they do how is actually for example in a company how is the goodwill impairment test actually conducted um, is there any room for managers to um, shape the results of this impairment test by their own incentives is that even plausible there's one study, for example, that uses a different method. And these are three colleagues from Finland who actually conduct interviews with financial accountants in a company, people that are involved with the impairment only approach with the, with the impairment testing. And they try to figure out how these guys actually go about the impairment test. And there are a lot of interesting insights in there that give us greater understanding about what's actually going on behind these numbers and what companies are actually doing. I think we should do more of that. The second direction has to do with cooperation. Um, again, researchers can do research on their own if all they use is archival data from databases. But I think we learn much more about um, our research setting about, for example, goodwill, if we engage with preparers, so the companies, if we engage with users, analysts, investors, and also the policymakers, for example, the ISB, if we engage with these practic uh, practice parties, with these non-academic parties, we learn much richer information about the setting, and we can also address some of the validity concerns. For example, we could interview the ISB we could talk to their board members and staff people. Do you consider um, value relevance the way that researchers implement it? Do you consider that relevant to um, the question of decision usefulness? Is that is that the way that you would think about decision usefulness? So we can help. Uh, we we can uh, um, interact with policymakers, and they could help us uh, with construct validity coming up with and developing measures that more closely align with uh, some of the concepts we're interested in. And finally, I've talked about external validity, right? I've said that um, a lot of the studies that we looked at are US-based. Now, the problem with that is in most uh, areas of accounting research, there is not a lot of reproduction going on. Are you familiar with uh, what a reproduction study is? Right, so a reproduction study, mm -hmm, go ahead. So somebody, Ahmad, you, you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to, would you like to say something? 
No, no, please, please clarify it. Say again. Can you can you explain it? What do you yes, mean by? Yes, of course. It? Yes, sure. So a, a reproduction study is a study that takes a given research question and analyzes it again in a different setting. For mm -hmm. example, if a US if a US study on US companies shows that goodwill impairment is driven by management incentives. It's not clear at all that this is also going on, uh, for example, uh, in China or in the European Union. So to me, it seems important that if we have important research questions, that these should be replicated and reproduced in different settings to understand to what extent they actually generalize. And if these questions are important, we also understand much more about the context. So we should we should be doing much more reproduction studies where we take existing research findings and reinvestigate them in different settings to see if they actually hold still today or if they hold in other settings in other countries. Maybe some of you have experienced this. Um, if, if you have an established US paper that looks at a certain research question, and you're going to take that research question and you're investigating it again, for example, using Egyptian data. Most journals that you that you sent this to would reject the paper because they say um, this is a me too paper, they call it, and I'm not learning anything new from this. And this is something that I find problematic. I think if research questions are important, we actually need to revisit them again and again. And these uh, um, reproductions are actually interesting and important. Okay, so this brings me to the to the end of my my um, research based presentation. Um, happy to take your questions if you have any. Um, if not, I would like to uh, go a little bit into, uh, or I would like to introduce to you a little bit the European Accounting Association. Any questions on the on the first two parts uh, so far? Ahmed Al Shahabi, you can ask. Hello, hello, Professor. Uh, thank you for your yes. presentation. I just have a question about the future research, you know, on goodwill impairment. Does it genuinely contribute to our body of knowledge if we accept, you know, goodwill impairments are driven by managerial incentives? And, uh, and we know that there's an ample evidence on the use of goodwill as a tool to manipulate reported earnings like big bath earning smoothing. Does the result in prior accounting research on earning management implicate to goodwill impairment? Or is it the effect of earning management that, are, that we will capture with the future research on goodwill impairment? I understood most of most of what you said, but but I, I have to I have to admit I'm not exactly clear about what it is you're asking. So the, the are you asking what future research should be looking at? Are you asking what future research should be looking at? So so in the in the paper we basically conclude that um, there is evidence first of all that goodwill accounting does reflect the underlying economics on average, but there's also evidence that goodwill accounting reflects management incentives and opportunism. Now, what do we conclude from that? Um, one of the problems is that we as researchers have a hard time um, judging how much discretion is too much. And one reason is that even if we show that goodwill um, accounting reflects management's incentives it's not clear that this is that this is necessarily a bad thing because to show that this is a bad thing you would have to show also that somebody suffers from this um, that management's incentives drive the accounting numbers and as a result other parties have a disadvantage and that's much much harder to show potentially investors anticipate that goodwill accounting reflects management's incentives and because they anticipate it they already discount the stock um, to take that into account so nobody has a problem 
right? So showing that there's opportunism involved doesn't necessarily mean that the accounting requirements don't work. Right, so I think we need to understand better how standard setters, what standard setters would actually like to achieve, how they would actually judge whether an accounting requirement um, is effective. And we don't know enough about what they think the accounting requirements should achieve. Ideally, they would tell us what to measure, and ideally, they would also help us um, measure these effects of accounting standards in a way that allows causal interpretation. And that's something that requires a great deal of interaction and, and uh, support from them, which is not uh, at the moment uh, something that they look uh, that they uh, seem to be willing to do. Uh, can, can I say something? Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for the answer. Just to make it very clear, you know, how goodwill research and goodwill impairment is different to earning management. That, that, you know, there is uh, overlap. Let me say because, because you know, good, goodwill is is op some goodwill. You know, impairments are opportunistic. Yes. I mean, does that let me say undermine you know the contribution of goodwill impairment research to our body of knowledge? Especially where there are uh -huh. a lot okay. of studies on earning management. So, so somebody would would say, whatever you do, guys, is just to uh, it's capture the effect of earning management. You do not yeah. genuinely contribute, you know, to our body of knowledge. I see what you're saying. Okay, so I see. So the question is, how how um, how fundamental is the contribution to theory? If you say if you say that. We know that incentives shape accounting outcomes. So if you say that, um, right, if you say that um, research has established that earnings management is happening, then you could say large parts of the goodwill literature don't contribute much at all because they only show this again and again in a specific setting. So on a very high theoretical level um, somebody could say we only need one study on earnings management and that takes care of everything um, that's not the way that i believe that that's not the way that i think in the current context um, the standard setters are interested in in the very specific issue of goodwill accounting so having studies on goodwill accounting is important and um, if we can confirm that the same earnings management uh, um, mechanisms are going on in goodwill accounting as well as in other areas too, then we're con confirming prior evidence. But it's not clear that this is necessarily the case. So yeah, you're right. Um, if you take a very high theoretical um, perspective, then it's not clear why we should keep doing earnings management research. Somebody could argue, well, we've we've actually found out everything we can already. It's not my view, though. OK. Good. Um, if you don't have any more questions on the on the paper. Yeah, you can ask. Yes. Yes. Somebody else like to ask them? Shall we? Yeah. Sven, open your open your mic Thank you. and ask your question. Yes. Hello, hello, professor. Thank you for your presentation. Hi. You hear me? Yes. Yes. Just uh, when you ask uh, about international uh, financial reporting standard. Uh, the, uh, uh, the ESA company uh, not applied the e EFRS. Why? Uh, which company? Yes, a company. Use ES Gap. Yes, that's right. Standard. Yes. Yes. So uh, the American, the American companies, they have their own yes. system, of course. It's yes. a gap. Between two, this standard. 
to standards this gap yes yeah oh okay so uh, are you asking I, are you asking what's the difference are you asking no, what's, no. The, what's between IFRS and the US gap no no there exists the difference between these two standards but yes the treatment of uh, of uh, goodwill impairment not the same uh, between two <coughs> standards no, it's not. It's not exactly the same. That's right. Um, f for me, Thank for you. me, these these standards are very similar. Uh, there are there are differences in the details in the details of the how the impairment test is conducted. For example, under IFRS, the impairment test is conducted at the level of the so-called cash generating unit. <laughs> under US yeah. GAAP, we do the impairment test on the basis of the reporting unit. Those are similar units, but they're not entirely the same. And there are some other detailed differences. But to me, um, the differences are actually pretty small. Okay. Yeah. I know. Uh, the Hello? Yes. Can you listen to me, sir? Yes, I hear you. Oh, thank you. Now, the question is that impairment, uh, there must be a con condition that impair must, impairment uh, must be done at the condition that a specific level of in income, profit level. After that, we must allow to do the impairment test. Like, you mean in the, you mean in the uh, IFRS uh, requirements? Yep. So, so the way that this is uh, regulated is any company that has goodwill yep. has to conduct an impairment test once a year at least, no matter what happens. If you're in great shape or not, doesn't matter. Once a year, you have to test for impairment. In addition to that, if there is an indication of impairment, then you would have to test uh, on top of that, even during the year, for example, now in the current uh, Corona pandemic, a lot of companies have conducted impairment tests in the first quarter, whereas they typically do their impairment testing in the third quarter. So there was an additional extraordinary impairment test because of the Corona, uh, the Corona impact uh, on earnings. Sir, that is an economic downfall overall. But I I want to connect it with the profitability. If there is profit, then you must be uh, able to connect it with the uh, as a an exp, uh, expense. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure. I I get your question. Um... As as per IS and. Uh, I, as per requirement of the standard, it is connected for once in the year. But if it is, it must be connected with the level of profitability that that has happened, and yes. on the basis of that, it must be taken. Absolutely. So, so we we have to distinguish. First of all, the question is: Do we have to conduct an impairment test? The second question is. If I conduct it, how much do I have to write off? The first question, conducting an impairment test, is linked to uh, indicators of impairment. And one of those indicators is, like you said, a decline in economic performance or um, an increase in market interest rates or uh, physical damage. Right, so clearly, the um, clearly, if there's physical damage, for example, you have to test for impairment. But then, when you actually do the test, the test will be based on forecasts of future cash flows, discounted at some discount rate, and using some growth rate assumption. Right, so it's not necessarily the profitability itself; it's it's the future cash flow assumptions, the future cash flow forecasts that matter. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So there's one question in the chat about what other empirical research topics do I recommend? 
Well, I can't I can't tell you um, I can't tell you the most promising ones from my perspective because then you would steal my ideas. No, just kidding. Um, I think what what is really a fascinating area at the moment is um, is the idea of non-financial reporting. At least from a from a European perspective, or also from a U.S. perspective, um, companies are more and more um, interested in documenting if they contribute to climate change, um, or if they actually uh, help to uh, avoid and and manage climate change. So environmental performance. Uh, social performance, uh, governance, diversity, um, human rights issues, uh, gender issues. Those are uh, areas in which companies also need to perform in the future, um, in addition to the financial performance. So non-financial aspects like that, non-financial performance will become as important as financial performance, I think. And it's not clear how do we measure non-financial performance. For financial performance, we know we have to measure earnings. That's difficult enough, but we at least we have one summary measure of financial performance, that's earnings. In the context of something like environmental performance or social performance, we don't have these, the, this one summary indicator, this one summary measure. So I think um, researching into how to measure non-financial performance, sustainability, environmental, social, and so on and so forth. That is something that has a very, um, very important implications and is, is I think, a big research area in the future. Just my, just my opinion. Okay. So if I may, uh, I would like to spend a few minutes to make some make some uh, advertisement for the European Accounting Association. As I said, we're very happy to have international members, including you guys. Um, just giving you a brief introduction about who we are and what might be uh, uh, why why we might be um, interesting for you to join. So. As I said before, we are geographically very diverse. We had about 2,600 members in 2018 uh, with, a, with a large increase over the years. The main event that we have is our annual Congress. Uh, so we have been doing these Congresses since the late uh, 70s. Of course, I wasn't involved at the time. Uh, I've been involved uh, since I became a doctoral student. Um, and these congresses have grown over the years. So the most recent ones had about 1,500 participants. So this is a very nice uh, type of event where you meet in a certain city and then you interact with your colleagues. Of course, all of this is now becoming more difficult in the corona situation. And we're currently looking into um, having an online virtual congress uh, next May. So the congress is always in May. And most of our members actually attended. So that's something for you uh, to consider, especially if we do this in an online version, which is much less expensive to uh, to attend because no travel costs arise. Um, in terms of research diversity, we're interested in all sorts of accounting research, any method, empirical or theoretical, uh, any topic could be financial reporting, it could be auditing, taxes, social, environmental, ethical issues, corporate governance, accounting information systems, digital transformation, all of that. So anybody with any kind of research interest, they're going to find their home in our association. Again, one of our key activities is our annual Congress, uh, which rotates around different cities in the broader European area. <laughs> Uh, we had uh, we had congresses uh, recently uh, in Cyprus, in Paphos. Uh, we already had one in Istanbul. Um, many of them are in Central Europe. So we had Paris, we had Milan, we had uh, Munich at some point. So this is one of our, our big events. 
But we also have a lot of initiatives that have to do with doctoral and PhD education. So one of our missions is to support young researchers, um, doctoral students, um, emerging scholars in order to do better in their own research and uh, in order to advance their careers. For that, we have the so-called doctoral colloquium, which takes place before our annual conference. We have the so-called PhD forum, which is taking place at the conference. Uh, and we have the so-called talent workshop. This is a job market where um, fresh PhD graduates going on the job market to obtain an assistant professorship somewhere. They can present themselves and the recruiters, the institutions are trying to hire, they will also be uh, at that talent workshop. So those are some of the things that we offer. Um, I think the best thing to inform yourself about what the EAA does would be to visit our website. And I'm going to show you that real quick. Um, it's called the EAA Accounting Resources Center, which gives you a lot of uh, material and a lot of um, interesting, uh, a lot of interesting resources to look at. So, for example, we have a blog where we have uh, um, a lot of active participants that actually um, post interesting new developments. Some of them uh, are contrib contributed by myself. For example, the Wirecard scandal is now currently um, occupying everybody's minds. We have a very interesting and um, comprehensive events calendar. So if you're looking for um, PhD courses, conferences, um, special issues in journals, all of these are listed here in our event calendar and you can look at them by topic and you can look at them by date. So you can look at them in a calendar format, right? All of this is listed here. So you're not gonna miss anything if you look at this uh, on, a, on a frequent basis. And there's also a repository uh, with a lot of interesting research uh, resources, for example, videos of seminars. So we have a very similar seminar like this one that you're having here. We have the so-called VARS or Virtual Accounting Research Seminar that uh, takes place once a week and where we uh, record the videos as well and post them online uh, for, uh, for later reference. So feel free to uh, visit this website. I'm going to post the uh, I'm going to post the um, link into the chat and uh, we'd be happy to uh, see you again in the future at one of our events. Okay. That's basically what I wanted to talk about, but I, I, now I see I have another question. Mahmoud is asking, um, do you expect the next EA even virtually will go ahead given the current situation? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, as you know, the annual conference is in uh, is typically in late May. We're currently assessing the situation. Um, the Congress has been scheduled to take place in Bucharest, Romania. Um, we're currently assessing the situation if it is possible for us to have um, a physical event in Bucharest. This is not clear at the moment, um, but we're also considering if that shouldn't be possible. If uh, we cannot do the physical Congress, then we're considering a plan B, which is going to be a virtual Congress. And that is something that we will definitely be doing uh, if the physical Congress cannot take place. Then we're going to have something virtual um, to, to, uh, to re replace it. Um, what are other forthcoming online events at the EAA? Um, I think the best way to figure this out would be for you to visit the uh, Accounting Resources Center. I can uh, give you a couple of uh, a couple of examples. So this virtual accounting research um, seminar will uh, resume in the fall. So starting probably in September or October, we're going to um, have that again on a weekly basis on Friday afternoons. Uh, there will be also um, 
another series of education related um, virtual events, for example, um, teaching workshops where people where people exchange their experiences about online teaching in the current Corona situation. And the third example is our journal conference. So we have um, the European Accounting Reviews annual conference, and I'm showing you this here on the platform. This was scheduled to take place in Berlin in September, but this has recently been postponed to an online conference because in Berlin we cannot do this on a physical basis, and this will take place virtually in November. So these are a couple of a uh, couple of examples. <coughs> All right. Good. Then if you have no more questions, again, feel free to get in touch. I want to thank uh, Mohammed and Mohammed, uh, both of you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. I hope that uh, I was able to tell you thank something you. interesting and uh, something that you that is useful to you. <laughs> And I wish you all the best for the summer and uh, keep doing this uh, great research yeah. seminar. I think it's a it's a great uh, uh, a great concept and you've been able to uh, attract from what I've seen in the list, excluding myself, very interesting speakers. So um, congratulations on this and uh, great job. Keep doing this. All right. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Professor uh, Sarson, uh, for your contribution and your effort. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, you have uh, done very well uh, with answering a lot of questions uh, there, uh, dear uh, Sarton. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so all that remains for me to say is thank you, uh, everyone that joined us. And I thank you very much for taking the time uh, out uh, to present to us today, uh, dear uh, Professor uh, Sorton. Uh, it's uh, been really appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you very too. Much. I hope to see you soon uh, in Egypt. Yes, that'd be great. I haven't been in Egypt. Uh, I haven't been in Egypt for for 23 years, so it's, it's about time uh, for me to go back. Hey, welcome, welcome All to Egypt. Welcome. Uh, for me to go back. Thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome. welcome back. Bye-bye. 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 Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.